afternoon, everybody. Sorry to make you wait a little bit today. Uh, a couple things here at the top. On uh, Burma, uh, the United States welcomes the opening ceremony uh, today in Burma of the Union Peace Conference, 21st century uh, Panglong, and commends all participants for their willingness to engage in an inclusive dialogue for national reconciliation and unity. This is an important process towards a lasting peace and the first step in an inclusive political dialogue that can help transform the country into a more democratic union in which the rights of all the people of Burma are fully respected. As a nation that has worked hard to draw strength and harmony from ethnic and religious diversity, the United States, of course, recognizes that this will be a long and challenging process that requires commitment from all people and institutions inside and outside the conference hall. The United States will continue to support this process and those who work in good faith, which includes dedication to the articulation and consideration of different points of view to bring an end to civil conflict in Burma and to achieve a durable peace that benefits and empowers all of its people. This is a schedule note. I think you realize now the Secretary uh, is uh, in New Delhi today as he concludes his participation in the U.S.-India Strategic and Commercial Dialogue. This morning he spoke to an audience of students, academics, business leaders, and journalists on U.S.-India relations at the Indian Institute of Technology, uh, Delhi. His remarks were followed by a short Q&A uh, with the students. He also met today with opposition party leaders and later at the American Embassy School, where he met with our embassy staff and family members. Uh, finally, the Secretary met with Prime Minister Modi to discuss climate change and the next steps for implementation of the Paris Agreement, as well as the deepening partnership between our countries. I think you may have also seen from uh, Mark Toner out there that the Secretary is extending his stay in New Delhi by a couple of days as he prepares to join the President uh, for the G20 in, in China later this weekend. And with that, we'll go to questions. Does he have any official events in New Delhi over the next couple of days? His schedule over the next couple of days is still forming up, and as we have more detail, we'll certainly provide it to you. Um, well, wh why is he staying, I mean, if he doesn't have official events? I didn't say that he didn't have official events. His schedule is still forming up, and as we get more information about that, uh, we'll certainly provide it to you. But uh, but he wanted to be able to attend the, uh, the G20, and so it just made practical sense from a logistical perspective, particularly as we had to finalize arrangements uh, for, his, uh, for his ability to join the president um, uh, to stay there in New Delhi while those arrangements were made. Um, Your hand so shot right up. We, Did you have another we, one? Yeah, no, okay, then I'll go one. to you. Me Mexico, um, as you're well aware, uh, Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump is, gonna, is traveling to Mexico today. Um, did uh, the U.S. State Department have play any role in uh, arranging or facilitating that trip? Did you provide any briefings to him prior to his trip? Will the embassy play any role in his visit there? The only, uh, the, the only uh, contact between the campaign and, and, uh, and, uh, and U.S. officials there was uh, with, within the Secret Service uh, and, uh, and security personnel uh, there in Me Mexico City to arrange the appropriate um, security requirements. The U.S. Embassy uh, was not asked to provide any support or, or briefings. Uh, for the visit, um, and uh, and so there's there's no expectation that um, our, our ambassador or our or any embassy personnel are going to be participating in the visit in any way. And um, just so we're clear, um, the Secret Service you know, protects presidential nominees. Um, is, to my knowledge, and maybe there may well be Secret Service personnel in the U.S. Embassy although I would guess they deal more with counterfeiting and stuff like that. Is it DS, diplomatic security, that's liaising with the Secret Service to make sure that his protection is appropriate and so on? For I, I'm given to understand that the conversations over security were largely between Secret Service personnel. Um, um, I'm not aware of any diplomatic security personnel role. I'll check on that just to be 100 percent sure, but I'm given to understand that it's, it was largely Secret yeah. Service, intra-Secret Service. And again, yeah. I can't speak for that agency. You should certainly feel free to contact them. But the, the, to the larger issue, yep. uh, the, the, the U.S. Embassy, our ambassador, Ambassador Jacobson, is, is not participating in the visit. There was no 
request by the campaign for any support or any briefings. And it's not something, and it's obviously not unprecedented for presidential candidates to travel abroad during their campaigns. I mean, President Obama did it as a candidate in 2008 to Israel and to France and to Germany. Um, uh, do you have any concerns, given the comments that uh, uh, the Republican nominee has made uh, in the past about Mexico sending rapists and murderers to this country, uh, his assertions that Mexico will pay for building the wall that he intends to build along the southern U.S. border, uh, despite Mexico's president saying that Mexico will not pay for any such wall. Do you have any concerns that such a visit can or would interfere in U.S.-Mexican bilateral relations? Well, I would, I would answer that by saying a, a couple of things. First, our bilateral relations w with Mexico are very strong and very healthy. Uh, and we look to continue that strong relationship. It's why uh, the Secretary was so eager to get Ambassador Jacobson installed down there in Mexico City, and uh, um, um, he believes that she's doing a terrific job. And so we, we look to that relationship continuing strong and, 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 and strengthening. Um, and uh, we believe that the relationship is, is strong enough um, uh, to be able to weather um, uh, uh, comments that uh, are made uh, by uh, candidates running for political office here in the United States, or frankly, candidates that are uh, in, in elected office in Mexico and things that they might say. Uh, our relationship is, is strong enough to, uh, uh, to weather um, those kinds of things. And, and so here at the State Department, uh, our focus is on um, not just our bilateral relationship with Mexico, but uh, but our multilateral relationships across the hemisphere, uh, to the north and and to the south of us, and 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 trying to make sure that we're staying engaged on issues that matter to all of us. Um, and migration is but one of those. It's an important one, but it's but one of those. And uh, you know, so is so is uh, counterterrorism. So are so are the concerns caused by narco trafficking. Um, I mean, there are, there are plenty of things for us to stay engaged with and, and have dialogue with, meaningful dialogue, uh, with, with leaders across the Western Hemisphere. Uh, sorry, one more on this. I realize you said that the embassy was not asked to provide any uh, briefings or uh, other assistance other than the intra-secret service dialogue, and you, you said you would check, I think, on whether DS had anything to do yeah, with that. Yeah, in fact, we can do that before the end of the briefing. Yeah. Maybe we can get an answer before um, the end of the briefing. Other than that, can you state that nobody from the U.S. Embassy, not the ambassador, is going to be involved in this visit? I mean, given that they're all, given that one could construe this as a campaign-related event, I'm guessing that they may be barred from taking part anyway. But, but basically, the ambassador, not the ambassador, nobody else other than the Secret Service is going to be involved in this event. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any participation by embassy personnel from the ambassador on down uh, in this visit. Yeah, let's stay on. The, I'm assuming we'll stay on this, the Mexico yeah, yeah, visit. Yeah, 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 we'll stay on that, and then I'll go to you. I promise. Go ahead. Um, so you said that his uh, that the U.S.-Mexico relationship is strong enough to weather um, comments by U.S. president uh, presidential. Candidates. I said comments by any elected officials, any elected either officials. here or there. So you're not saying or could, a, a, a people running for elected office. I think sure. is how I said it. Putting it that way kind of makes it sound like. Such comments are, you know, kind of a, a nuisance or some kind of problem for relations. But is that is that what you meant to imply? Or? No, I didn't say that. If I if I wanted to say nuisance, I'd have said nuisance. I said it's it's a relationship that's strong enough to weather uh, the the comments and rhetoric that you often hear on uh, you know in, on, on political campaigns. And I, and as you know, I'm uh, I, I I've made it a, a stringent practice not to engage in. Uh, in a debate from this podium with, with anything that's said by any of the candidates uh, in, in this in this election or any other election. Um, that's not our focus, uh, and we're not going to engage in um, uh, in the politics. We are engaged in the policies, the, the foreign policy agenda that this administration is pursuing in the hemisphere. Okay. It's just that saying saying it has to be weathered implies that it's some kind of problem, but that's, that's not what you mean. No. no. I mean, I... 
I wasn't troubled by my use of the verb weathered. I, but, I mean, I was they, because I, I was simply trying to convey look, we're not we're not <laughs> we're not ignorant here. I mean, I, I read the coverage just like you guys do. I mean, uh, we see the comments that are made, um, and as I've said many times from this podium, and the secretary has said himself, uh, um, foreign leaders around the world do frequently ask the secretary. Um, uh, about some of the comments that are made by candidates uh, in this uh, in, in this election, um, you, that's not of surprise, and some of those comments uh, concern them. Some of them concern them quite deeply, and um, and so when I used the word weather, it was to express the fact that some comments made on on, on, the, on the political campaign trail do uh, cause our allies, our partners, and our friends around the world concern. And those are concerns that are expressed to us because we're the ones out there uh, visiting them, talking to them, engaging with them on a wide range of issues. So I'm okay with the way I use the word weather. Thank you for clarifying. And then just last one. Um, is it typical of visits like this for the, relation, the um, contact to be purely focused on security in, in previous uh, visits by candidates for major candidates for president to other countries, have U.S. embassies in those countries played more roles in terms of, um, I don't know, participating in the visit, or is it usually just focused on I, I don't, I can't speak for every past foreign visit by uh, a, a candidate for, uh, for office. Um, but there are some basic guidelines, and Arshad sort of alluded to this in his question, um, which I think I have here somewhere. Um, no, that's not it. Maybe it's in the front. See, I have to go to Elizabeth to figure out where it is. Um, there are some basic guidelines that we have to, uh, that, that embassies are allowed to do. And again, in this case, uh, the there wasn't any ask of support, and I'm not aware of anything other than on the security front. Um, but in the past, we have uh, been able <coughs> to um, provide some support, like uh, providing support to a Secret Service protective detail, um, providing assistance on security matters as necessary for conditions in that particular country. And every country has different security parameters, as I think you might understand it. In the past, we have uh, been able to brief uh, the candidate with appropriate information before any meetings in accordance with U.S. interest in ensuring that as an important visitor from the United States, he or she is knowledgeable about recent developments, important issues, uh, and U.S. positions on those issues. But as I said uh, to Arshad, there was no such request for that kind of support or briefings uh, in this particular case. So there's a, there's a, there's a limited amount of things that we can do. Um, uh, but again, uh, and Arshad alluded to this, and then there's, there's obviously restrictions as well because we cannot engage in, um, in inherently political activities during an election season. Thank you. Are we still on this? Yes. You're still on this? Yes. Still on this. How many people are still on this? Raise your hand if you still want to stay on this issue. Okay. So we'll go here and then over here. All right? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so you said that the embassy is not helping out at all during the visit. Did they advise against the visit at all? Um, there, were there was no recommendation by embassy personnel or the ambassador, uh, one way or the other, with respect to uh, whether this visit should occur. No recommendation made whatsoever. Uh, Dave. Yes. Um, if uh, a candidate is talking to a foreign leader and makes some kind of diplomatic breakthrough, do you expect to be briefed on that when he gets back? Uh, you said that in the past it's, he doesn't complain about being offended. If he manages to mollify the, the Mexicans, to, would, would he be coming to the State Department? I, I wouldn't even begin to entertain yeah. speculation about what the outcome of, of this visit would be. That is entirely for the Trump campaign to speak to, not mm -hmm. the State Department. I, I wouldn't even begin to, to speculate about that. So Again, if a U.S. national is talking to a foreign leader, that would be of interest to you if anything substantive came out of it. I, I didn't say that we, that, that we, we weren't 
aware of the meeting and, and wouldn't be interested in it. I'm just saying that this is between the Trump campaign and, um, and in this case, President Nieto, and how they characterize their discussion today is up to them, and the State Department isn't going to get in the middle of that. And our focus is on the afterwards. Our focus is on the relationship else. now and getting and, and continuing to look for ways to strengthen it going forward. Um, I, I'm, we're not going to get into um, any kind of speculation or conjecture about what may be discussed or what the impact of what may be discussed going forward. That is for these two gentlemen to discuss. And on this visit, you haven't, you didn't receive any, uh, any prior requests for assistance. Have you, from any of the candidates, received any requests for future trips? I'm not aware of any. And. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not that would be up to the campaigns uh, to really Yeah, that, that, all, that would all be uh, for campaigns to speak to, but I, I'm not aware of any. When yeah. did you learn of the request? Of the, not of the request, when did you learn of the visit? Uh, I don't know exactly when uh, the embassy was informed. I'll have to take that question. I don't know. You, you, meant, you meant talked a lot about before, what is happening before the trip, and you just alluded to what will happen after the trip. What about no, no, no. I did not allude to what's going to happen to the trip. Dave did. Ah, okay. But what is happening during the meeting? Will there be a That is a great question for the Trump campaign and Trump President campaign. Nieto's office. I have, I have no idea, and we're not concerning ourselves with that. So okay. th there will be no State Department uh, representation in that meeting? No, I've said that three times today. Okay. Three, three times. Okay. Are we still on this? Nope. nope. Everybody's satisfied on this? I promised this young lady would go to her next. Go ahead. Guyane. My name is Guyane. Uh, Reuters and CNN quote unnamed U.S. officials who say Russia's claim that its airstrike killed ISIL leader Abu Adnani is a joke. Does the U.S. officially dispute Russia's claim? I'm sorry. Can you say the question yes. again? So uh, Reuters and CNN quote unnamed U.S. officials who say Russia's claim that its airstrike killed ISIL leader Abu Adnani is a joke. Does the U.S. officially dispute Russia's claim? Uh, first of all, this is an issue for the Defense Department to speak to, and I think they already have, and uh, believe what they've said is that uh, they conducted an airstrike. This individual was the target of that airstrike. They're still determining and assessing the results of that strike, and that they had not made a determination yet about the success of it. And I think that's where they've left it. I know that these unnamed officials are, are quoted as, as, as disputing uh, Russia's claim. So the U.S. does not officially dispute Russia's claim. Is that, is that what you're saying? I, I, I'm not going to, again, the Defense Department has spoken to this. It's not for the State Department to uh, uh, speak to the results of a specific airstrike. Um, I can only point you back to what they've said. Um, and I, I know you all would love me to make comments about every unnamed official that, you know, uh, says things to, to media outlets. I, I don't know who these people are. I don't know uh, how much information they have, and I'm simply not going to in, entertain conjecture about the accuracy of uh, anonymous quotes by officials from who knows where. Um, I can only all I can all I can do is tell you what I know, and what I know is based on conversations I've had with my colleagues at the Pentagon and what they've told you themselves. There was a strike. This individual was the target of it. They're still assessing the results. They don't know yet whether it was successful or not. The, if, if the U.S. and, and you, you, your colleagues, although they are unnamed officials, uh, dispute Russia's claim, then they presumably know who, who, who killed Adnani. Do you? Do you? I, I do. I, I, I know. I, again, I can only tell you what I know. This individual was the target of a strike. Strike occurred. They're assessing it. They don't know the results of it. I, I can't go beyond the facts. Those are the facts as we know it right now. I understand. There, there's a lot of confusion in the media over who did this, and that confusion is based on conflicting reports from... From unnamed officials. From there's the a shock that yeah. unnamed yeah. officials yeah. are causing yeah. confusion in the yeah. media. <laughs> um, why, why this confusion? Are the U.S. and Russia coordinating? The confusion space? is because you guys are reporting unnamed officials who we don't know who we don't know who they are. We don't know how accurate the information is that they have. That's the confusion. Guyan, is that how you say your name? Yes, That's Guyan the confusion, is. Guyan. I agree with you. The, 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 not not between you and me, but between people quoting these unnamed officials. Again, I think the Pentagon has been as clear and concise about this as they can be at this stage, and it's not unusual for there to be a time lag between when a strike is taken and when you can make an accurate assessment of the results, particularly when uh, a strike is targeted at an individual. 
um, that, that can be, be a difficult process to, to identify BDA, battle damage assessment. So um, we just have to let the Pentagon do their work, and, and when they have a conclusion, I'm sure that they will speak to it one way or the other. More, more of a policy question. Are the U.S. and Russia coordinating those strikes? Because, uh, you know, it seems both the U.S. and Russia were targeting the same person. Wouldn't it be something that the two countries would coordinate? The, our, there's no coordination of airstrikes between the United States and Russia. That hasn't changed. Um, and your question is, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice? Uh, I, I, <laughs> that's really for the militaries to speak to. Uh, what I can tell you the Secretary's focused on, and today you know, our, our two technical teams have resumed work in Geneva, and the Secretary's very intently focused on that effort, which, as you know from the press conference last week with Foreign, Mar excuse me, Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, uh, both he and Secretary Kerry uh, made progress with trying to solidify uh, proposals uh, that would allow us to get an enduring cessation of hostilities across the country, uh, which would keep the regime from violating uh, that cessation by killing their own people and, and going after opposition groups and trying to reclaim uh, territory, uh, as well as providing for uh, better mechanisms for the United States and for Russia to share information about uh, 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 tactical uh, issues there in Syria and targets. Uh, but that hasn't, hasn't been solidified yet. That's why our teams are, are, are meeting again uh, today, starting to meet today. Okay? Is this disagreement over who killed this propaganda chief for ISIS, will, will that possibly derail that conversation about tactics Common ground that, that we're leading towards. I, I can't see any. It? I can't see any way that it would. You can't. There, there, there's this. I mean, your colleague at the Pentagon, half hour ago, basically pushed back, disputed the Russian claim, said it was probably propaganda, and and you know. So we're disagreeing about who who gets to claim credit for taking out one of the leaders of this group. That's not going to derail the conversation? I, no, I answered the question the last time you asked it. That, I, I can't we, see any way that it, that it would. These discussions are, are important. Both uh, governments are committed to them. As I said, the teams have, uh, have resumed work today in Geneva, and we look forward to seeing that work progress. Perhaps this will give us an, an impetus to move faster towards that. Move that, faster towards what? Toward uh, sharing information on tactics and targets. Well, I think everybody shares the impetus to getting there, but based on the, the, the terrible imagery you saw coming out uh, uh, of Syria a week or so ago with that, with that young boy, and then the images that followed later about what's happening in Aleppo, I think, I, I think there, uh, as the Secretary spoke to, a real sense of urgency here about uh, the violence and the bloodshed and the need to, to stop it. That's, well, we're that's, the, impetus. that's the impetus. That's the impetus. For getting the these two teams back together again in Geneva. Huh? We're talking about whether or not the Americans and the Russians are coordinating their kinetic attacks on the Islamic State. They are not coordinating, They're as not. I said. And would an incident like this or a disagreement over who actually killed a top leader, if you're, if you're asking, would that lead to possibly moving faster towards agreeing? There's already, there's already enough sense of urgency to get these technicalities worked out and to have these discussions and, uh, uh, and, and to to try to reach an agreement. Um, and that's what's driving us forward. It's, it's the need to end the bloodshed. It's not this, uh, this, these news claims one way or another about who killed uh, this particular terrorist uh, and whether or not he's dead, in fact. I mean, I, I, I haven't, I've seen no confirmation that he is. Um, so I, I, I find the whole thing, the, the, the whole kerfluffle, uh, uh, rather quizzical, given that, you know, we were talking about the potential of a very dangerous individual now being removed from the fight, and hopefully the earth, and we still have a very significant diplomatic effort going on now in Geneva to try to more solidify um, a, a process by which the United States and Russia uh, uh, can begin uh, uh, to cooperate more effectively uh, inside Syria against groups like Nusra and, and groups like Daesh. Thank okay? you. Um, are you also not deconflicting? 
I think the work of deconfliction is still ongoing. I think the Pentagon spoke to that, um, but I'm not an expert on what that entails. Yeah. David Global, President Television. I wanted to ask you about any reaction of the U.S. government to the decision of the Senate in Brazil today. Oh, I just turned over to Brazil. <laughs> All right, we'll stay on Syria, but because I know where this answer actually is. Oh, yes, you want to go no. Back to Syria? No, no, what, can, uh, can you wait? Brazil and then you yeah, go back we'll, to go to, we'll stay in the region and then I promise I'll come back to you. I actually, I know where the answer is to your question. I'm like, <laughs> well, I'll ask quickly so it's not, you don't put your hand, but a Turkish official said today that there was no ceasefire between Turkey and Turkish and YPG forces in Syria. That was ostensibly rebutting a U.S. claim from yesterday. So my question, what is the situation in terms of Turkey versus the YPG forces? Is that conflict still ongoing? What, 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 exactly, what exactly did their comment refute from yesterday? Uh, yesterday, a, a U.S. official. Uh, uh, oh, another unnamed official. No, no, no. He, he, it was a, a spokesman for Operation Inherent Resolve said that there was a ceasefire. He said, I think, I think there, you said there was an agreement. Okay. But... Look, and then today that a Turkey, the Turkey's minister for European Union affairs said that that was not true. There was no agreement, a ceasefire. And so, I, my question was, what what is the situation? What what has the U.S. been doing to try and end the fighting between these two allies? Uh, what well, I think it's exactly the way I described it yesterday. We're, we're still seeing uh, calm between the two sides, uh, and we welcome that. We want to see that continue. As I said yesterday, we're uh, uh, we are um, in communication with both sides and um, working to establish communication channels between them uh, uh, to help deconflict operations and, and maneuvers in a very crowded uh, uh, battle space. Um, but nothing's changed about, aside from that, what we want to see, which is every member of the coalition, all of these parties we're talking about are members of the coalition to focus their efforts on, on Daesh. And you feel you're having success in this effort at that kind of common To the degree system? that there has not been clashes uh, now uh, in the space of a couple of days, uh, we certainly welcome that. We think that's, that's positive. Um, but we recognize that it, um, those tensions, as they were before, uh, need to be continually uh, discussed, worked out, um, uh, uh, and, and nurtured uh, so that we can try to keep um, the kinetic activity uh, aimed at Dash and Dash only. John, just on that, that, that answer right there, you talked twice about both sides and talked about how you're trying to get them to talk to each other. You, in the answer, you put the two sides on a kind of parity, and that has offended Turkish officials in the past. Yesterday they came out and said, they refused to be talked to as if they were just two parties on equal standing in the way American officials talk about them. They regard uh, the, the YPG as a, a terrorist group and they say they're a sovereign nation and a NATO ally. They don't want to be talked about in that way. Do you accept that criticism of the language? I, I, we understand that concern, and I'm not, by, by referencing it that way, I'm not at all uh, 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 equating uh, the YPG with the sovereign nation of Turkey, who, as you noted, is a, a, uh, a full member of NATO and uh, as a sovereign state, uh, as a state, uh, a, a member of the coalition. I mean, obviously, that, um, you know, that is a significance that we, we certainly recognize. I was simply uh, using terms and words to re reflect the fact that we've got two sides here that were, uh, as of a few days ago, uh, actively um, shooting at one another instead of uh, coordinating in, uh, their activities and shooting uh, at Daesh. That's all. But absolutely, we recognize that Turkey is a sovereign state. Uh, are we on this? Still on this? Do you have any information about a U.S. citizen uh, who was arrested in Turkey? Who was arrested in Turkey? Yes, I can confirm that U.S. citizen Lindsay Snell was detained in Turkey 
On the 7th of August, 2016, she is currently being held uh, in a prison facility in Hatay province, I believe that's how you say it. Consular officers from the consulate in Adana visited Ms. Snell most recently on the 26th of this month and are providing all possible consular assistance. The embassy and the department are following this case closely. <coughs> State Department officials have been in contact with Turkish government officials regarding this case. Um, Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, Snell, S-N-E-L-L. Did you have more? Yeah, is, is, was the arrest at all related to um, her profession as a journalist or in any case that any way associated with that? Uh, what, I, what we understand is that she has been charged with violating a military zone. Um, but I, 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 I can't speak to her reasons for being in Syria, for traveling there. I, 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 I can't speak to that. And what I can tell you is that we've been informed she was charged with violating a military zone. That she entered a military zone that she wasn't supposed to? Or? That would be my interpretation of that, Arshad, but that's a better question for Turkish authorities since they're the ones that, that uh, issued the charges. Did you say she was arrested in Syria and is held in Turkey? I'm sorry, I just didn't hear, hear the details exactly. Sorry, she, was, you said she, she's was been, uh, she was arrested, detained in Turkey, okay. and, and has been charged with violating a military zone. I thought the word Syria came out of your mouth, and I just wanted to make sure there, there wasn't... Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, uh, as I understand it, um, she journeyed to Turkey from Syria, and I, what I, my answer was, I couldn't, I couldn't speak for why she was in Syria in the first place. The question was, was she doing the business of journalism? And I don't know. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. On North Korea, uh, and President Obama recently mentioned on uh, NFU. Um, no first use of nuclear. But the North Korean Kim Jong-un continued to threat North Korea use a nuclear preemptive attack in the United States. What is your comment? Uh, I, I, I'd say what I've said before. Um, it's long past time for the North uh, to stop these provocations. Uh, to abide by their interna uh, international obligations, do right by the people of North Korea, and cease these uh, the pursuit of, uh, uh, of advanced ballistic missile activity and, and nuclear capabilities. Um, it's doing nothing to provide security and stability to, to the peninsula, um, and, uh, and doing nothing to um, enhance uh, uh, security and stability in, in the region writ large. But the, uh, the one for up again. The, we know the uh, <coughs> United States is strong support for safety and uh, security of uh, U.S. allies in South Korea with the nuclear umbrella. But this long signal may send misconcept message to what North wrong Korean signal? Kim, Kim Jong Un. I mean, is the, the no use, no first use? Well, I've seen some press reporting about this. This. Uh, uh, this alleged um, policy shift, and I, I, I have nothing for you on that. And uh, that's, you, you know. What about the North Korea using first? I uh, mean, first to using of nuclear weapons, but still, U.S. cannot use. I mean, I'm not sure I understand I mean, the question. Need to confuse. Well, North Korea perhaps having a first use of nuclear weapons policy. About North Korea having a first use. Yeah. Well, I think my answer to that would be exactly the same, Jenny. Uh, 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 um, we've seen the bellicose rhetoric. We take that seriously. We have to take that seriously based on the actions uh, uh, that we've seen coming out of the North, um, uh, which is why we are going to remain just as committed as we always have been to our alliance with uh, uh, the Republic of Korea. It's why there are the discussions about uh, the potential deployment of, of a THAAD system there. Um, um, and it's why we're going to continue to exercise and operate with uh, defense forces uh, uh, from the Republic of Korea to make sure that we have the capabilities uh, ready uh, at all times um, to, to protect uh, the people of South Korea. And that, that th this kind of, these kinds of comments and 
the kinds of activities that the regime in the North have uh, conducted are all the more reason why we're going to stay committed to uh, uh, to our alliance commit uh, our alliance uh, requirements. But the, this suggestion, uh, Obama's suggestion, but uh, that uh, Secretary of Kelly and uh, Defense Secretary Carter didn't accept his suggestion. I, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, 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 rumors and interagency discussions one way or another. The United States has serious security commitments uh, on the Korean Peninsula, uh, and uh, we're going to continue to meet them, right. period. Uh, wait, I've, this, this gentleman has been waiting for a long time. Let me go to you on Brazil. Go ahead. Can you reaction? Have I, uh, have a now you have to give me a second to find okay. it. <laughs> okay, reaction's here. I just have to get okay. to it. Uh, look, we've seen reports that the Brazilian Senate, in accordance with uh, Brazil's constitutional framework, has voted to remove uh, President Rousseff from office. We're confident that we will continue the strong bilateral relationship that exists between our two countries as the two largest democracies and economies in the hemisphere. Brazil and the United States are committed partners. We cooperate with Brazil to address issues of mutual interest uh, in the 21st century's most pressing global challenges we plan to continue. Uh, this very essential collaboration. There is any uh, communication after the decision between the U.S. government and, and Brazil? Uh, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't have any diplomatic discussions to, to speak to uh, today. Again, this was a, a decision made by the Brazilian people, and uh, obviously we respect that. Do you know if uh, now that President Temer and President Obama are in the G20, uh, uh, if they will need to have uh, any bi bilateral meeting, do you have any uh, request uh, from the Brazilians uh, to, 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 to do that? You'd have to consult my colleagues at the White House for uh, the, the President's discussions at the G20. That's not for us to speak to. Finally, the last question, uh, do you know if there is any arrangement for President Temer to come and visit uh, President Obama uh, in the next month? Again, I'd have to ask you to consult my White House colleagues. I'm not aware of any. Uh, and wouldn't be for us to speak to the, the travel schedule of another foreign leader uh, anyway. Bill? Sure. Uh, would it be normal to send a letter of congratulation to a, a, a new president? Would it Temer be? has been apparently, has, has been, uh, you, you noted uh, President Rousseff has been, uh, has been moved out, but I understand uh, new President Temer has been officially nominated. Would it be normal to? To congratulate it's you. not uncommon for us to congratulate uh, new, new leaders. Right? I'm not aware of any correspondence at this time, Dave. Isn't there any concerns about the nomination process? Any concerns? Uh, there, there's evidence that the key promoters of the of Bill Morissette's impeachment process uh, wanted to shield themselves from the investigations of corruption. Was that of any concern to the U.S.? I would say two things. This is a, a an internal Brazilian matter, and um, I think. I would refer you to Brazilian uh, authorities for more information about those concerns raised. What I would say is we believe that Brazil's democratic institutions have acted within its constitutional framework. And uh, I, I know that over 40, uh, if, if I remember that correctly, uh, members of Congress wrote a letter to Secretary Kerry asking the U.S. to express concern over, over the proceedings. Has the U.S. Uh, has, has the Secretary uh, Over these proceedings? Uh, impeachment process overall. I, I, I believe they sent a letter two weeks ago. Has Secretary Kerry responded? I'll have to check on that. I'm not aware of the correspondence, so let me, uh, let me see if, if, uh, if, in fact, we have uh, received something. Um, and, um, but as always, uh, uh, when we do get congressional correspondence, we respond appropriately, which is back to the requesters. Uh, uh, and that, that, that's the forum, that's the right way to do it. Um, and if we did get such a letter, I, I'm sure we'd be preparing a response along, you know, uh, along that process. But let me just check to see. I don't know. But do I understand it cor correctly? Just, just, just to clarify, there was no concern. Uh, the U.S. had no concern over the way, over these proceedings, over this, this process. As I said, we believe that Brazil's democratic institutions have acted within its constitutional framework. <coughs> Laura? First, it's been now about six months since the UVA student Otto Wangiru has been, uh, since he was sentenced there. Um, we're now understanding that he hasn't had consular access in quite a while. Um, are there any concerns that um, these calls from the U.S. for him to be released on humanitarian grounds are falling on deaf 
years in my career. Well, you've seen, I think, uh, you may have seen comments from me uh, on this. Um, you do understand that uh, the DPRK court has convicted uh, Mr. Warmbier. Uh, he's reportedly charged with, quote, hostile acts against the DPRK and sentenced to 15 years hard labor. We believe that sentence is unduly harsh uh, for the actions that Mr. Warmbier allegedly took. Um, despite official claims that U.S. citizens arrested uh, in the DPRK are not used for political purposes, it's increasingly clear from its very public treatment of these cases that the DPRK does just that. Uh, this underscores the risks associated with travel to North Korea. Uh, we continue to strongly recommend against all travel by U.S. citizens to North Korea. We urge any U.S. citizen considering travel uh, to uh, get on our website, travel.state.gov, and read the, the travel warning. Now that he has gone through this criminal process, we urge the DPRK to pardon him and grant him special amnesty and immediate release him, immediately release him on uh, humanitarian grounds. Have you gotten any signals that that's likely? I'm not aware that, uh, of any such signals. And as I think I noted earlier, uh, our protecting power, Sweden, uh, last was able to visit him in March. So it's been a while. And then separately, but still in North Korea, um, there are reports that a education um, official was executed recently. Two other officials were sent to these re-education camps. And now, just even since I've been here, I've seen a report that another official was um, executed for falling asleep during a meeting that Kim Jong-un was presiding over. Is this turmoil, this um, shakeup going on in the North Korean regime of concern to the U.S.? Well, I can't uh, verify the accuracy of these reports. Um, I've seen some media reporting along those lines in the last several days myself. Um, but if it's true, it's just more examples of uh, the brutality, the depravity uh, of this regime, um, and certainly um, gives no one any comfort uh, about the direction that the regime is going in, um, uh, or um, uh, would give us any reason uh, to be anything but continuously vigilant about our security commitments on the peninsula. Again, Jenny, I've seen the reports. I'm not able to independently uh, verify them. I mean, we've seen this tragically before, these uh, the reports of these kinds of executions. Yeah. Um, well, okay, let me go here and then to you, Goyle. What do you want to ask about? Okay. Uh, let's go here. Thank you. So, um, you, you mentioned about the Secretary Kerry staying back in India. Now, when he landed, he, there was a one hour delay due to traffic or rain problems. Then he had to cancel his uh, visit to three religious uh, sites because of traffic problem. He arrived one hour late at the IIT Delhi. Are you concerned about that, you know, when, but uh, knowing that in Delhi when the Prime Minister or the ministers travel, the roads are just empty there, you know. So was there any security risk by, you know, can you confirm all these delays which are being reported in the media? What is the reaction of the State Department to this kind of treatment of uh, the U.S. Secretary of State there? It's rain. <laughs> no, it's not just rain. <laughs> I, I, that's, that's I, a, I would that, love to complain about the a, weather, that's but a, that's, that's I'm not sure that's going to get us It is rain the first time they were ill-prepared. What about the, the repeated... Uh, the Secretary has had a terrific couple of days in India, and he's grateful for the uh, support, um, the courtesies, the time um, of Indian officials. Uh, as he wraps up the strategic and, and commercial uh, dialogue, as well as, quite frankly, uh, the, the time and attention that was afforded him in uh, the bilateral discussions that I've now read out to you for the last couple of days. Um, yeah, there were some delays because of rain, and um, not even the Prime Minister, who we uh, have great respect for, uh, can do much about that. Uh, uh, it's, it's weather. And, um, and that it caused some delays, I think, 
would be expected. As I understand it from talking to Mark, my deputy was out there, that this wasn't just a sprinkle. Um, this was pretty significant rain, uh, you know, right up to the top of the tires on on, on the cars. And you you, you want to be safe more than anything. So you're asking me, are we concerned about security? That was your second part. Absolutely we are. Part of being safe and secure is being careful when you drive in the rain. I grew up in Florida. <laughs> I know a little bit about that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very good answer uh, diplomatically. But, uh, oh, no, 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 the, no, no, no. Here's a very ground, good answer, period. On the, on, on the ground. The first time is acceptable. What about the second, third times? Like it's the the relationship that we have with India is exceptionally strong and getting stronger. Under I was Prime not Minister questioning Modi's the, uh, relationship. Leadership. I was questioning the way these happen. Uh, and I, I think I've answered the question. I. Uh, the secretary was very grateful for the support and the courtesy and the time that he was afforded by Indian leaders over the last two days. I, I'm a little befuddled that you want to make a diplomatic row out of this, uh, the fact that some of the meetings didn't start on time. Um, welcome to the State Department. Uh, uh, that, that just happens. Um, and yeah, I was late for the briefing. And that wasn't even, and that wasn't even weather related. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, but it, look, it's, it's been a great couple of days, and uh, and uh, as I said, and I, we've been very open about uh, the, the progress. You've seen his remarks, uh, uh, his, his public comments and remarks, and uh, um, he was very glad to be able to be in New Delhi and uh, uh, and uh, and to have these discussions. And uh, we look forward to continuing that deep relationship going forward. Huh? You you again? No, not you, him. Yeah, me again. On this Absolutely. same issue? No, different issue. Okay, well, let's stay on India and Thank South you, Asia yeah. for a while. Thank you. Uh, as far as your relationship between the U.S. and India is concerned, uh, my question is that uh, so many agreements and meetings and greetings took place in Washington and also in Delhi. My question is that uh, uh, because of this relationship, special on security and uh, economics and commercial and uh, strategic uh, and uh, defense, uh, but at least China and Pakistan across the border are not very happy and they're opposing all these special relationship and agreement between the U.S. and India. Anything that uh, where we go from here because of their opposition? Well, look, I, it's hard to uh, get too specific on the answer there, Gore, because I don't know what agreements you're talking about that are causing uh, angst by Pakistan or, or China. Um, uh, but, you know, Broadly speaking, uh, we've said this before. Uh, I kind of dealt with it a little bit yesterday with a, a question about um, uh, whether or not President Putin was going to go to Japan. Uh, we don't view relations with other countries uh, as zero-sum games. Um, and um, I, I can't speak for why uh, one sovereign nation or another might have a concern about a bilateral relationship that we are uh, working to advance and improve. Um, all I can tell you is that those relationships are important, and the United States remains globally engaged on a scale that no other nation in the world is. Um, and uh, the Secretary is committed to uh, uh, staying engaged uh, as much as possible, and there's, there should be no reason why, in this particular case, uh, that any other nation should view uh, the deepening and strengthening of our relationship with India as a threat or a challenge. Uh, this, is a re this is a relationship that's decades and decades old, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we expect that it will remain strong um, and, uh, you know, going forward decades and decades to come. There's, there's no, no reason to view it as a threat or a challenge. Maybe one more quickly on the region. Um, as far as G20 in China is concerned, um, many nations in the region uh, are fear that China is uh, building some fear for some smaller nations in the region. But uh, as far as uh, G20 is concerned, and some of the nations will be in G20, including India, what do you think, uh, how serious is this Chinese uh, fear in the South China Sea and the G20 meetings they are hosting? I'm not sure I understand the question. The, 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 uh, uh, that how the G20 leaders will take this China's fear in the South Asia China's Sea. China's fear in the South China yeah, Sea? building up against the smaller nations in the region. 
Well, look, I, I'm not going to get ahead of the G20 agenda, um, uh, but obviously when, uh, 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 when we are engaging, um, particularly partners in the East Asia Pacific region, uh, and I can't speak for other nations, just for us, uh, uh, the tensions in the th South China Sea routinely come up. Um, and I wouldn't be the least bit surprised that, uh, that the, those tensions are discussed uh, over the course of, of, of the G20 uh, 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 summit. But um, nothing has changed about our views here. We're not taking a position on individual claims. We do take a position on coercion. Um, and we want to see uh, 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 disputes resolved peacefully, diplomatically, in accordance with international law. That's not going to change. Uh, the, the President has spoken to this, the Secretary of Defense, certainly Secretary of State Kerry. We are and will remain a Pacific power in the United States, which means uh, that from a military perspective, we have a presence there and, that, and we're going to maintain that presence. Uh, but that's only one element of the Asia-Pacific rebalance. There's a lot more to that. And, and I also expect that over the course uh, of the coming days at, at the G20, that other aspects tied to the rebalance, economic aspects, diplomatic aspects, political aspects, will also be on the agenda. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, there's reports that the Revolutionary Guard in Iran have charged an Iranian-American with national security charges, and uh, they didn't name the individual, but it, the details they gave seem to fit uh, Robin Shahidi. And Shahidi, uh, and I just wondered whether you had any information. Uh, I, all I can tell you is um, uh, uh, we – safety and security of U.S. citizens remains uh, obviously our top priority. Um, we have seen reports of, uh, uh, of detentions uh, of U.S. citizens, uh, and uh, we, um, we continue to uh, raise our concerns about that, continue to use all the means that w at our disposal. Um, uh, to advocate for, for their release. I just can't go into any more detail than okay. that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have a comment on uh, the first U.S. commercial flight to touch down earlier today in Cuba, um, first time in 50 years, over 50 years? I think um, what I would say, we've seen the, certainly seen the r reports of that. And um, look, I think, you know, it's a, a positive step forward in the normalization uh, of, uh, of diplomatic uh, relations between, between our two countries. So we welcome this, um, this first scheduled passenger flight uh, from the U.S. to Cuba. Um, uh, indeed, it's, it's historic. Uh, uh, and again, the, pres the, the President's policy uh, uh, is simple, uh, the goal of it. It's to improve the lives of Cubans and to advance the interests of the United States. Uh, and we believe that the best way to achieve that goal is by facilitating more interaction. Uh, between the Cuban and the American people, including through travel uh, and commercial opportunities and through more access to information, uh, which all that culminated, of course, in the President's uh, trip to Cuba. Yes? Uh, I sent you the emails um, yesterday. Do you know how many of uh, the Secretary Clinton's uh, emails were about the 2012 incident in Benghazi? Um, and do any of those contain classified information? Um, as we've said, uh, the Department agreed to search the materials that we received from the FBI in response to several pending uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, and to the extent that responsive records are identified, produce them. Uh, using broad search terms, we have identified approximately 30 documents that are potentially responsive to a Benghazi-related request. And I want to stress the words potentially responsive. That doesn't mean that they definitely are. It means they are potentially responsive. At this time, we have not confirmed that the documents are, in fact, responsive or whether they are duplicates of materials already provided to the Department by former Secretary Clinton uh, back in December of uh, 2014. And I'm not aware uh, of – because we're still working our way through that, I'm not aware of potential classification. Now, today, a spokesman for the Clinton campaign said, quote, some not if – or some if not all of those emails are duplicates. Is that right? As I said, we're still working our way through it. Um, um, we have not confirmed um, that either they are actually responsive to the Benghazi-related request or that they are duplicates of materials that we have already had. We're still working our way through that.
They still don't know if there's any contained classified information. I have no information on that right now. And then why did the State Department ask for five weeks to review roughly like 30 records? Uh, because I think you need to keep in mind that this isn't the only FOIA request we're staffing right now. Um, and we've talked about over the last three years a dramatic increase in, in FOIA requests, not just in the number, but in the scope of the information that they're seeking. Um, it's, it's a major undertaking. Um, and uh, 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 the FOIA staff is working as hard as they can. But to prepare even one document for release through FOIA it requires work and it requires effort. We have a responsibility to be responsive. We also have a responsibility to, uh, uh, to protect sensitive information before it's released to the public. So um, uh, I'm not going to speak to the specific filing here. You talked about the timeline. What I can tell you is that um, you have to understand that this is but one of many, many FOIA requests that we're staffing, and and very few of these FOIA requests that we see are simple and direct and only a and asking for you know very discrete information. They're often asking for lots of information over a long period of time, and that takes that takes effort. So one of the emails that has been released before it's a 2013 email um, shows that she shared classified information after she left the State Department. Um, is that appropriate? Is there any sort of administrative action? Um, I believe your office should. Yeah, so um, <coughs> I, I would say um, a couple of things to that. Um, we are <coughs> responsible to FOIA of preparing documents uh, for release today. Um, and we're not in that process. We're not concerning ourselves whether it was classified at the time. So I want to just get that off the table. So our job is to prepare them for release today. And sometimes that does mean uh, making redactions. And some of those redactions go along with and are tied to uh, uh, security uh, upgrades. Um, uh, and the reason why uh, this document is included was even though it was, you know, I, I can't speak for the, uh, the the reason it was sent post her time at the State Department. That's really for her and her staff to to speak to. But it was, as I understand, it sent to people who who were here, still working at the State Department. Which means then that we possess that as a record, and therefore under the Freedom of Information Act request in this particular case, we're had, we're responsible for. It, being responsive to that request, responsible for preparing it for release, and so we did that. Okay. Is there any? But is is that unusual for her to be emailing about classified information after she's left the post? Well, again, I I, I can't speak for former Secretary Clinton's email practices after she left her post as Secretary of State. Is it unusual for prior Secretaries of State to communicate with? Uh, current staff, particularly in, in not long after they've left, absolutely, that's not unusual at all. Um, and then your question about classification, I just want to be clear. Uh, th this, in this information uh, was uh, redacted for release according to the Freedom of Information Act, which is our responsibility. Um, and it was classified at the confidential level, which, as you know, is the lowest level of security classification. I'm not going to speak to the content, um, but I would point to you that you know one of the FOIA exemptions here that we used was 1.4b, which is uh, foreign government information. Um, and as we previously explained, while foreign government information may be protected from public release, both the executive order on classification and the foreign affairs manual acknowledge that foreign government information often can be maintained on unclassified systems, and yet we have a proscription to, if, if to, in order, you know, in order to release a document that contains foreign government information, um, it has to be redacted. Um, and right now, our uh, uh, the rules that we're operating under uh, require that that redaction be accompanied with a confidential. Um, uh, classification. I'm not, again, speaking to the specific con con content, but I just wanted to make clear because you'll see on the document that the exemption was 1.4b, and that's foreign government information, and 
there are some limits in terms of how we can treat that when we prepare it for a redaction. Does that make sense to you? Okay. I know it's a, it's a fairly complicated process. I want to make sure I understand that right. Are you saying that under your current rules, all foreign government information uh, must be uh, uh, not just redacted, but redacted and classified as confidential? It's not what I said, Marsha. No, I'll no, read I'm it again. I'm trying to understand it. No, just, you don't have to read it again. Just help me understand it. It doesn't. It may be, while 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 foreign government information may be protected from public release, um, uh, according to the executive order and the Foreign Affairs Manual, um, it can be maintained on unclassified systems. Yeah, I so that. I, know, I got that. Um, so when we decide that foreign government information being asked for in a FOIA request needs to be redacted. Um, we have to redact it. But according to the rules that we are under now, it's redacted with a confidential uh, classification marking. That's the rules. We've asked for uh, an exemption to that, and we don't have it. So right now, when we exempt foreign government information, it is exempted with a confidential marking. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the information redacted is, in fact, confidential. The rules require a confidential marking when it's redacted and, and released for, for the public. Okay, I get, I get it. Now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me go to Abby. Let me let me go to Abby. Uh, Venezuela. Okay. Do you have any information regarding reports that several journalists attempting to go into Venezuela? Uh, to cover the upcoming anti-Maduro rally were turned away at the airport. Um, and uh, along with the uh, seeming increase in arrests of opposition activists ahead of the rally, are you concerned that this is part of a widening crackdown? Uh, I haven't seen uh, any report of uh, arrests at the, at the airport. Um, so let me get back to you on that. And look, we are our concerns about uh, uh, freedom of assembly and freedom of speech there in Venezuela are long known. I just don't have any information on that particular question. On Iraq? Human rights watch says the Iraqi government backed militias have recruited children in preparation for an offensive to drive ISIL from Mosul. They call on the Iraqi government to take action to demobilize child soldiers. Has the U.S. raised the issue with the Iraqi government or are you even aware of that? I'm not aware of that report. Obviously, we would. Uh, 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 strongly condemn the use of children as soldiers uh, uh, in, in any uh, armed conflict. Um, and, but I'm not aware that the, the, of this particular report. Uh, yeah. I'm Jackson Brosco with Global News from Canada. I wanted to ask you about Caitlin Cole. Look at that. Thank you for introducing yourself. That's very nice. I'm a newbie. So. That's no, but nobody else does that. That's great. Uh, um, Caitlin Coleman, the American held in Afghanistan with her Canadian husband and their two young children. Um, yes. There's a new hostage video out uh, apparently yesterday uh, in which she is uh, presumably at the behest of her captors urging the American government to press the Afghanis to adjust their policy with respect to yeah. executing Taliban prisoners. Just wondering what actions are being taken to secure their release. Is the U.S. taking the lead? Is Canada taking the lead? Um, well, I, I can't. Uh, here, let me let me let me do it this way. And I talked about this a little bit yesterday. We're certainly aware of reports uh, of that uh, of this video featuring uh, U.S. hostage Caitlin Coleman and her husband Joshua Boyle. Uh, uh, we're aware that that video has been released. As I understand it, that video is still being examined, um, and I don't have an update for you uh, on it. Um, we obviously remain concerned about the welfare of, of Caitlin and her family, uh, uh, and we continue to urge their immediate release on humanitarian grounds. We are regularly engaged with the governments of Afghanistan and Pakistan at the highest levels to emphasize our commitment to seeing our citizens return safely to their families. Um, uh, we are going to continue to work aggressively, as we have in the past, to bring all U.S. citizens held hostage overseas home. Okay. Is it's down in that uh, answer. Do you suspect the group holding them are linked to the Pakistanis? We have, we have, we have said that um, before that um, uh, that we believe that they are somewhere in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. Hey, you got a couple of quick ones. And I'll do them. They're all substantive. Um, are they going to require me to keep flipping back and forth all are, over this? And that's why you work out every morning, so you have the strength. Can we do it in alphabetical order so that I can just go through the book that way? <laughs> well, <laughs> then we'd have to do it in State Department alphabetical order by bureau. By bureau. Right? Let's do that. Okay. 
four hundred. Um, all three are within NEA. All right. Wait. Give me a second. Let me get okay. to the NEA tab. All right. I'm there. The first one concerns Israel and the Palestinian territories. Okay. Give me a second. I. All right, I'm ready. So there's a report that the Israel's military runs civil administration in the West Bank has approved today uh, the construction of 284 new housing units in uh, Jewish settlements uh, in the West Bank. Um, do you have any comment on that approval? I can give you the names of the settlements if you need them. Deep, we're, uh, I, I do actually have comment. Uh, we're deeply concerned by the government's announcement to advance plans uh, for these settlement units in the West Bank. Since the Quartet report uh, came out, we have seen a very significant acceleration of Israeli settlement activity that runs directly counter to the conclusions of the report. Uh, so far this year, Israel has promoted plans for over 2,500 units including over 700 units retroactively approved in the West Bank. We are particularly troubled by the policy of retroactively approving unauthorized settlement units and outposts that are themselves illegal under Israeli law. These policies have effectively given the Israeli governments uh, a green light for the pervasive advancement of settlement activity in a new and potentially unlimited way. A significant expansion of the settlement enterprise poses a very serious and growing threat to the viability of the two-state solution. Can you read that one sentence again, the final one about the, um, in a potentially unlimited way? Yes. These policies have effectively given the Israeli government a green light for the pervasive advancement of settlement activity in a new and potentially unlimited way. Second, um, uh, Syria reports of three American uh, citizens who mm. have been killed in Syria apparently while fighting with Kurdish forces. Uh, what can you tell us about those three men? I had to go back to the American Citizens tab because I don't have them in my nearest Asia tab. I can't answer for that. We've been working to help facilitate the return of the reported remains of private U.S. citizens killed in Syria. We remain in close contact with local authorities and stand ready to provide all appropriate consular assistance. I have no additional information right now on this. Can, can you provide any other kinds of information about um, whether you know the fate of these three men, whether it is in fact three men, whether you have any understanding of how they may have uh, perished? Can you provide anything on that? I'm afraid I can't. Okay, right nothing now. on names or anything else. I'm afraid I can't go okay. any further than that right now. Yep. And then the last one is on Yemen. Uh, we have a, just oh, yeah, on. sorry. Yeah, please. Just more broadly, obviously you have an existing travel advice for Syria and Iraq. These are private citizens, not not military personnel. Do you have any particular concerns about um, U.S. citizens traveling to take part in the conflict over there, and or whether there's adventure as mercenaries or sympathizers with the, the Kurdish cause? Do you have any idea of broad numbers of Americans who may have done that? Uh, and do you have any particular message for them? Uh, I don't have an idea of numbers. Uh, I, can, I think you can understand. We, we, we don't, we're not able to, to keep track like that. Um, but since 2011, we have urged all U.S. citizens to avoid traveling to Syria, and we strongly recommend those who remain in the country to depart immediately. Um, uh, the government does not support the activity. The, the, the the travel to Syria to participate in the conflict in, in any way whatsoever. We don't support that activity. And our ability to provide consular assistance to individuals who are injured or kidnapped or to the families of individuals who die as a result of taking part in a conflict is extremely limited. Uh, and this is probably a question for your Pentagon colleagues, but I'll try in case you remember the rules. If any of the, the and some of these people I understand are veterans, they're no longer serving U.S. military, but if they're uh, reservists, could they be breaking military rules? You'd have to definitely refer yeah. to the Defense Department. Okay. I'm That's not, I don't, I don't know enough to yeah. do that. You had one on Yemen? Yeah. Yemen. Um, uh, we have a report that um, the Saudi Arabian-led coalition conducted an airstrike um, that uh, 
killed uh, at least 16 members of the extended family of a Yemeni imam. Um, one of the photographs that we have show, uh, taken by our photographer, shows uh, the body of a child uh, being uh, dug out of the, the rubble. Um, you've often spoken about the need for all sides to avoid uh, sparing casualties in Yemen. Do you have any information on this particular incident, and have you raised it with the Saudis or others? Uh, well, we've seen reports of the strike, um, and uh, uh, we express uh, our deepest condolences uh, to the, the families of, of the victims. Um, as the Secretary made clear when we were in Jeddah just uh, last week, attacks that kill and injure civilians actively undermine the attempts to peacefully resolve Yemen's challenges. Uh, we have repeatedly expressed our deepest concern about the ongoing airstrikes and the heavy humanitarian toll that's being paid by the Yemeni people. And again, that's why the Secretary was in Jeddah, to try to find a way forward to put an end to the conflict. Uh, we are urging, continue to, urge all sides to return to a cessation of hostilities which can create the conditions necessary for a return to peace talks. And that's really the way we think this is going to get resolved. And have you raised this particular incident with um, the Saudi government or with other members of the coalition? I'm not aware, because this incident is so new, I'm not aware that we have raised this uh, in diplomatic channels, but it is not uncommon at all for us to have routine conversations with the coalition about uh, uh, the kinetic activity, the airstrikes, uh, and the precision. It's not unusual at all. But I, I just, in these, in these hours after, I just don't have any conversations or readouts. Okay, I gotta go. Uh, I'll take one more. You, go ahead. <coughs> No, I said one more, and then you think, not a two-part one question, just one exactly. question. Exactly. Uh, I mean, the U.S. says that, I mean, PYD forces have been uh, withdrawing to the east of Euphrates River. Uh, however, Turkey, I mean, uh, says that there are not enough evidences to confirm that. I mean, it seems there are two different claims on that issue. I mean, PYD forces have been withdrawing or not? Uh, I think, look, I think, I think General Votel spoke to this. I'm, I'm, again, I'm going to be wary of speaking to operational maneuver. That's not our role here. Um, but General Votel spoke to this yesterday, um, and he made clear uh, that the arrangement had been, after Manbij, uh, 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 Kurdish forces would move back to the east of the Euphrates, and that they have met their commitment. I can't go into any more detail than that. As I said yesterday, I'm not capable of counting ears and noses, uh, but I, I can only point you to what uh, the Defense Department said yesterday. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Oh, wait a minute. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Sit. Uh, in answer to the question I promised before the end of the briefing, diplomatic security did, did not, did not provide assistance to the U.S. Secret Service on Mr. Trump's visit to Mexico today. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, now you can get up.